Good afternoon. Uh, this is the first lecture in a series of lectures from the Southern California Reformed Baptist Pastors Conference in 2021 uh, in La Mirada, California at Trinity Reformed Baptist Church. Um, I gave this lecture back in November as a PowerPoint presentation. However, unfortunately, uh, the audio for that PowerPoint presentation in that session was not recorded. So I am currently re-recording session one from the Southern California Reformed Baptist Pastors Conference to an empty room <laughs> and without a PowerPoint presentation. So it's a, a re-recording and a, a re-presentation of session one of this conference. And in this lecture, in this, se in this session, I want to focus on presenting chapter seven of the Second London Confession of Faith in historical and theological perspective, understanding the confession's historical perspective, or, or it's the confession's historical context is important for understanding uh, chapter seven and the choices that were made relating to its content. Uh, and we need to understand that historical, pers that historical context and that theological uh, context. So by way of introduction, just consider briefly with me the, the history, a historical introduction to our Confession of Faith, which, as you will recall, our Confession of Faith, the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith, was first published in 1677. 1677. It wasn't published in 1689 originally. It was published in 1677. In fact, it was never published in 1689, just in 77, 88, and 99. But anyway, in 1677, the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith was published, and it was published <clears throat> anonymously. It didn't have any names uh, relating to the persons who had uh, composed or edited this confession. It didn't have any names relating to who had published it. It didn't have the names of any churches or, or any names whatsoever. Uh, it simply was called a confession of faith put forth by the elders and brethren of many congregations of Christians baptized upon profession of their faith in London and the country. So you know that this confession represents a, a good number of churches, and by churches it means the officers and the members of those churches, and that these are Baptist churches. They're baptized upon profession of their faith. That's what defines them. But there's no specific names relating to the confession, and that, that was intentional. This anonymity was intentional because in 1677, the particular Baptists were nonconformists. They did not practice religion according to the established form of the Church of England. They did not conform to that, so they were nonconformists, which meant that their assemblies, their church gatherings, were illegal, and they were subject to prosecution and fines and worse punishments if they were discovered. And so the last thing they would want to do in publishing their confession was put their names in, in such a document because it would open them up to persecution. So the confession is published anonymously. It's published in 1677 during a time when the particular Baptists were nonconformists and when nonconformity was illegal. Now, it's important to understand that context, that historical context, uh, in order to understand some of the purposes of why the confession was published. So consider with me in the second place the, the purposes of publication. And the, the confession itself explicitly tells us various of the purposes uh, for which the confession was published. Did the Baptists just decide one day in 1677, were they sitting around and said, you know, it would be a really great idea. Let's publish a confession of faith. No, there were specific historical factors uh, that led to the publication of the confession of faith in 1677. And I'm not going to get into all of those, but some of them uh, as we consider the purposes of publication. So let's read a few quotes from the confession that states its purposes. And the reason why we're surveying the purposes of publication is to better understand some of the editorial choices that were made in chapter seven of the confession. So in the confession, it says, uh, we have also industriously endeavored to manifest that in the fundamental articles of Christianity, we mind the same things and have therefore expressed our belief in the same words that have on the like occasion been spoken by other societies of Christians before us. So the confession is published with the intent of expressing 
uh, the same beliefs in the same words as other Christians who have published similar documents previously. This is, of course, um, referring to the Savoy Declaration and the Westminster Confession. The Baptists are intending to show that in the fundamental articles of Christianity, in the in the orthodox truths of the faith, they believe the same things and so therefore have used the same words to express their belief in comparison to or in relation to previous documents, namely the Savoy Declaration and Westminster Confession. And those documents, of course, connect to other things such as the Irish Articles and the 39 Articles or the Irish Articles of the Church of Ireland and the 39 Articles of the Church of England and other documents as well. So the Confession is published with the intent of expressing agreement. Uh, The Confession also says, this we have done, that those, we have published this, and in this way, that those who are desirous to know, and excuse me, I'm going to back up a little. This is coming from the appendix on baptism. In the appendix after the confession, there's a few more things stated relating to the purposes for which the confession was published. And they say, this we have done, we've published this confession, that those who are desirous to know the principles of religion which we hold in practice may take an estimate from ourselves who jointly concur in this work and may not be misguided either by undue reports or by the ignorance or errors of particular persons who going under the same name with ourselves may give an occasion of scandalizing the truths we profess. This is very important because the particular Baptists are saying that if you want to know what we believe, then we want you to judge that based on this document. We've done this to, so that those who desire to know what we believe in practice can learn from it from us, who, who jointly concur in this work. This represents a common agreement of the people publishing this. And then they, they mention two false sources of information about what they believe in practice. First, some people are misguided by undue reports. There, there can be false reports. There can be bad um, rumors Uh, or scandalous things said about the particular Baptists, and the particular Baptists are saying, don't listen to that, listen to us in this confession. And then secondly, and you may remember things like Daniel Featley or Thomas Edwards, who published things about Baptists in general and labeled them Anabaptists and said that they baptize naked and they're immoral and all kinds of terrible things. Uh, The Baptists were were, uh, sullied and they were um, frequently maligned by all sorts of false and undue reports and and insane exaggerations. But they also say that they're doing this because some will be misguided about what they believe in practice. It says, by the ignorance or errors of particular persons who who go under the same name with ourselves. So there were some people who were known as particular Baptists who believed and practiced things that were heterodox, that were wrong. And this is where they are referring in particular to Thomas Collier, Thomas Collier had published in the six, earlier in the 1670s um, a book called A Body of Divinity or A Confession of Faith, which was a very long and large book, uh, which, in t- which published it, it was published in a way that presented itself as a confession of faith, seeking to teach the entire system of Christian doctrine. In fact, its subtitle was Or, A Confession of Faith, and Thomas Collier's Body of Divinity Uh, advanced a variety of significant and severe theological errors. And when he was, when Thomas Collier was confronted about this by other ministers in the country and in London, he doubled down. He published another document called, or another book called An Additional Word to the Body of Divinity uh, in 1676. And so his Body of Divinity and his Additional Word to the Body of Divinity uh, the, the additional word just made things worse. He didn't retract his errors. He made them even, even more plain. And because Thomas Collier had been among the particular Baptists for, for decades at that point, had planted many churches, had published many books, and was well known as a public figure, therefore his errors required a public response. And this was done in a variety of ways. They, the particular Baptists confronted him in person at his church with a face-to-face conference. And when that did not produce his repentance, they sent letters out to the churches about him. But they also authorized a book to be written by Nehemiah Cox uh, in, in, to refute 
uh, Thomas Collier's errors, and that was put out in 1676 called um, Vindicii Veritatis, or a confutation of the gross errors of Thomas Collier. Well, why is it that in 1677 we see the particular Baptists publishing a confession of faith at that moment? Well, it's because of the scandalous reports about them that had been circulating for many years, but more particularly because of the urgent need for a public vindication of their faith and even a profession, a confession of their faith in light of Thomas Collier's recent publications and serious theological deviations. Now, to to summarize these things, we see that some of the purposes in publication for the particular Baptists are to express agreement in the fundamental articles of Christianity. So you're going to see them intending to show agreement in fundamental truths with other Christians. You're going to see them distancing themselves from errant persons who go under the same name with them. They're, They're trying to show we are Orthodox and we agree with Orthodox Christians. Their purposes, therefore, are not to disoblige or alienate uh, pedo-baptists. They say this themselves. They say in the, in the appendix on baptism, they say, although we do differ from our brethren who are pedo-baptists in the subject and administration of baptism, yet we would not be from hence misconstrued as if the discharge of our own consciences herein did, in, did any ways disoblige or alienate our affections or conversation from any others that fear the Lord. So the particular Baptists are saying, yes, we believe, have a, a different doctrine of baptism with regard to uh, infants not administering baptism to infants and the mode of baptism. And yes, we have our own assemblies, our own congregations because of this. But they say we do not want this to give the impression, they say we don't want to be misconstrued that we, that we have uh, hatred or uh, lack of love towards our pedo baptist brethren. So the, the, what, I, what we are trying to understand here is that the purpose of the confession is not to launch a war against pedo baptists Their desire and their intent is not to disoblige or alienate pedo baptists It's not a polemical document. It's a document that's expressing agreement in fundamental articles, and a document that is distancing itself from severe heterodoxy, indeed from the heresies of Thomas Collier. And it's very important to note that in these statements, the particular Baptists say that they jointly concur in this confession, which means that what made it into this document is what they can jointly concur to or agree in. And they themselves say that they omit certain things where they don't agree. So you can read the confession and assume the people that published this, this represents the things that united them. This does not represent the things where they had different opinions amongst themselves. And they, the particular Baptists themselves say this again in the Appendix on Baptism with relation to baptism and the Lord's Supper. There were different views about open versus closed communion at that time, and the confession intentionally avoids this issue because it is a document in which they jointly concur. The Baptists say, we are not insensible, that's a double negative to say, we are aware (laughs) that as to the order of God's house and entire communion therein, there are some things wherein we as well as others are not at a full accord among ourselves. It's an area in which we have diverse views. And then they go on to say, and therefore we have purposely omitted the mention of things of that nature that we might concur in giving this evidence of our agreement both among ourselves and with other good Christians in this important in these important articles of the Christian religion mainly insisted uh, on by us. So you see here that the, the Baptists jointly concur in this confession and they have omitted something such as closed versus open communion purposely so that they might concur, again, using that same language. Now, this is important to understand uh, the choices that, that were made in the editing or the composing of chapter 7 of the Second London Confession of Faith. And we'll get to that in just a moment, and we'll talk about it in later lectures as well. But we need to notice, we need to notice up front, don't expect a polemic against paedo-baptism in chapter 7, and don't expect 
uh, things in which they disagree to appear in chapter 7. You should expect fundamentals and common agreement in chapter 7. Now, <clears throat> before we can look at chapter 7 itself, which we'll survey in a moment, we need to briefly take a look at the basics of Reformed Covenant theology. If the confession is intending to express agreement with fundamental articles and fundamental truths, we need to understand what some of the fundamentals were in, in Reformed and Protestant covenant theology. So consider seven, seven basic points about Reformed covenant theology which need to be understood to appreciate um, chapter 7 itself, but also just to have a general understanding of covenant theology in that day and in that time. So seven brief points about the basics of Reformed covenant theology. In the first place, to understand Reformed Covenant theology, we need to understand the law and the gospel as contrary doctrines. The law and the gospel as contrary doctrines. By contrary doctrines, we mean that the law teaches one thing and the gospel teaches another thing. And what those two teach are contrary. They, they are mutually excluding of one another. So what this means is that the law says, obey uh, do that which is right in order to have your own righteousness, your own record of obedience. Your righteousness is your works. The law says you must work, you must do, you must obey. That's what it teaches. Do this. Whereas the gospel teaches something contrary. The gospel says do not do your own works, do not be righteous in yourself, but rather hold out your empty hand and receive and rest in the righteousness and the works of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. And so the law and the gospel are contrary doctrines. If you are working to have your own righteousness, then you are not resting in and receiving the righteousness of Christ. They are contrary doctrines. The Reformed Covenant theology also stands in the second place on the basis of the law and the gospel as successive periods of history, the law and the gospel as successive periods of history. There is the time of the law and there is the time of the gospel afterwards succeeding it. The time of the gospel succeeds the time of the law. It's just two historical time periods. So you'll, you will very frequently see in, in literature the language of the time of the law and the time of the gospel. Now, in the third place, the first two points go together. The first two points where the law and the gospel are contrary doctrines and the law and the gospel are successive periods of history. So in the third place, we must understand that the law and the gospel as contrary doctrines run through and are present in the law and the gospel as successive periods of history. So the, the law commanding obedience and the gospel commanding faith are present in the time of the law. And the law commanding obedience and the gospel commanding faith are present in the time of the gospel. It's important to understand that the law and the gospel are spoken of in these two distinct ways, but these two complementary ways. The law and the gospel as contrary doctrines is not at all opposed to the law and the gospel as successive time periods. The law and the gospel as contrary doctrines are present in the time periods of the law and the time period of the gospel. In the fourth place, it's necessary to understand that the papists hold that the gospel is a new law. The gospel is a new law that is easier to keep, one which is uh, simpler and more merciful. And so Reformed Pro Protestant theology and Reformed covenant theology uh, is fundamentally opposed and in protest to the idea that the gospel is merely uh, a new law. The, the law and the gospel as contrary doctrines directly opposes the idea of the law of the gospel as a new law, the law 2.0, the law easier to keep. And so Reformed Covenant theology is responding to and resolving that error. In the fifth place, the Anabaptists and the Socinians, they hold an error that says that the gospel was absent 
during the time of the law. The time of the law was just the law, and the time of the gospel is just the gospel. And so during the time of the law, there was no gospel. And during the time of the gospel, uh, there is no law, uh, etc. And so Reformed Covenant theology is also responding to these errors. The idea that the time of the law and the is equated with the law, and the time of the gospel is equated with the gospel. Those first two points resolve both both the Papist and Anabaptist or Socinian errors. The law and the gospel are contrary doctrines. The gospel is not a new law. And the law and the gospel as contrary doctrines run in or are present in and run through the time of the law and the time of the gospel. And so as Reformed Covenant theology or Reformed Covenant theology is, is built on these two fundamental distinctions of the law and the gospel as contrary doctrines and the law and the gospel as successive time periods. And we see this in fuller expression and more developed language in the language of the covenant of grace. There is, in the sixth place, there is one covenant of grace, and it is different in substance from the covenant of works. Reformed covenant theology affirms a covenant of grace different in substance from the covenant of works. What it is and what it does and what it grants is between the two are completely different. Uh, so as the law is not the gospel and the gospel is not the law, so the covenant of grace is not the covenant of works and the covenant of works is not the covenant of grace. The covenant of grace is not a new covenant of works easier to keep. The covenant of grace offers free salvation in Jesus Christ, the righteousness of Jesus received by faith. So these two different covenants, different in substance, the covenant of works and the covenant of grace, are a development in greater language and precision of the law and the gospel as contrary uh, doctrines, which is not to equate law and covenant or gospel and covenant necessarily. It's just to, to relate them and to show that the covenant of works and grace are at bedrock, at, at the foundation, built on the law and the gospel as contrary doctrines. Well, we also see the law and the gospel as successive time periods finding ex expression in Reformed Covenant theology. So Reformed Covenant theology also speaks of the one covenant of grace, which we already mentioned, that one covenant of grace, that gospel grace, being administered differently in the times of the law and in the times of the gospel. The, the grace of that covenant, the, the saving grace of the, of, the, of the covenant of grace is administered, it's dispensed and received uh, differently in the times of the law and the times of the gospel uh, in, a, in a movement of clarity from less clarity to greater clarity, uh, from types to, to realities and such things. And so what you have here is the same grace, uh, the same saving grace being given to and received by all of Christ's people in all of history through one covenant of grace. The one covenant of grace administered differently in the times of the law and the gospel. And so the covenant of works and the covenant of grace running throughout history but the covenant of grace being administered differently in the times of the law and the times of the gospel, these, this articulation of Reformed Covenant theology is built fundamentally on the law and the gospel as contrary doctrines and the law and the gospel as successive time periods. Now, this survey of the basics of Reformed Covenant theology helps us to understand some of the editorial choices in chapter 7 of the Second London Confession of Faith. Because in chapter 7 of the Second London Confession of Faith, we find an affirmation of these very basic commitments of Reformed Covenant theology. And that makes sense because one of the purposes of the confession was to assert agreement in fundamentals. So in chapter 7, we do not see a detailed argument about the more debated points of covenant theology. And there were many, uh, many points to be debated and many deb debates about those points. But they're not present in chapter 7 because that's not the purpose of the confession in general, nor the purpose of chapter 7 in particular. It's, it's a non-polemical document, and so therefore chapter 7 is a non-polemical chapter. But we also... Uh, we also find chapter 7 to be the way that it is 
because while there was a very strong majority view among the particular Baptists about the, the finer details of covenant theology, it was not uniform. They did not all agree. Uh, in, the, in the debates and the conferences with Thomas Collier in the 1670s, uh, the London elders were very prominent in this, but they were not at all the only churches and the only elders involved. It talks about London and the country. And probably the second most important center of particular Baptist influence and strength after London were the Bristol Baptists. And the Bristol Baptists were heavily involved in that Thomas Collier uh, period of time and the conferences and the debates and, and everything. So the Bristol Baptists are represented by the Confession of Faith. They jointly concur with the London Baptists, the London Particular Baptists, and others in the Confession. And in fact, it was the Bristol Baptists above, above all or more than anyone else who were of the open communion uh, persuasion. And so the Confession omits that that subject precisely so that the Bristol Baptists and surely others, but especially the Bristol Baptists, could uh, agree and jointly concur in the confession. Now, I bring up the, the Bristol Baptists because one of the Bristol Baptists, uh, an important and well-known, respected and prominent one named Thomas Hardcastle, had a view, his views in covenant theology were not like the majority views of, the, of most of the other particular Baptists. Thomas Hardcastle uh, believed that the Old and New Testaments or the Old and New Covenants were merely two administrations of the one covenant of grace. Hardcastle said in some lectures on the Westminster Shorter Catechism, he said, there is a covenant of grace and there is a twofold administration of this covenant of grace. There is the old administration, which is called the Old Testament, the new administration, which is called the New Testament, both one covenant, though called old and new, though called too commonly, but one covenant. Most of the particular Baptists would have disagreed with this kind of articulation. And to be specific, they would have disagreed with the idea that the old covenant and the new covenant were the same covenant, only differing in outward administration. But Thomas Hardcastle was not an, an obscure or unimportant, unimportant minister. He was well-known, respected, published, uh, and uh, he was a friend of Nehemiah Cox and, and others. So he was, he was no small figure in the movement at that time. And what I, want to under, what I want to emphasize at this point is the fact that chapter 7 does not include the finer points of the details and debates of covenant theology, not just because it's a non-polemical document, not just because their, their purpose is, not, is to express agreement with others, their purpose is also to express joint concurrence or joint agreement amongst themselves. And so chapter 7 is written uh, in, a, in a way that Hardcastle could certainly agree with even if he was different from the majority of the rest of the particular Baptists. Not, and I don't mean he's the sole outlier, but he's certainly in a, in a minority, a very, very small minority. He could agree to the language of chapter 7 uh, without issue, as I read it. Um, and that's important to understand. And in, we will come back to this as we discuss the wisdom of, of ch uh, in particular, paragraph 3 in a later session of this conference. So having uh, introduced the historic, briefly the historical context of the confession, having surveyed the purposes of its publication as well as the basics of Reformed Covenant theology, and having pointed out how these things inform the editorial choices we see in chapter 7, what I want to do now is briefly survey chapter 7, read, e read each paragraph, make a few comments about each paragraph in preparation for future lectures, and then uh, draw to a close with a few conclusions. So consider with me a survey of chapter 7, paragraph by paragraph, with a few comments on each paragraph. If you walked into Benjamin Harris's shop in 1677 and you bought this book and opened it up to chapter 7, uh, what would it say? It would say in the first place, in paragraph 1, the distance between God and the creature is so great that although reasonable creatures do owe obedience unto him as their creator, yet they could never have attained the reward of life 
but by some voluntary condescension on God's part, which he hath been pleased to express by way of covenant. Notice with me uh, from paragraph one, ever so briefly, that covenants are voluntary. Uh, Covenants are voluntary condescension on God's part. That means God chooses to do this. Covenants are of God's will. Covenants are not necessary. Covenants are voluntary. This will be important for a later lecture, which I will present focusing on paragraph one. Notice also that chapter seven in general uh, and paragraph, uh, well, yes, chapter seven in general is not focused on the covenant of works. That That's one of the big differences between this chapter and that of Savoy or Westminster, but that's because the particular Baptists have already covered the the important parts of the covenant of works in chapter 6. It makes sense to discuss the covenant of works in chapter 6 of, of man and, and his fall into sin because the covenant of works precedes man's fall into sin, uh, whereas the covenant of grace uh, succeeds or comes after man's fall into sin. So ch- the covenant of works is not focused on in chapter 7. However, we do find in chapter 7, paragraph 1, that the reward of life is unavailable except by way of covenant. The reward of life is impossible to obtain except by way of covenant. So therefore, the reward of life was offered by way of covenant. That is a confession of the theology behind the covenant of works, and in comparison with the use of the term later, as well as what's established in, in chapter 6, uh, the covenant of works is here in chapter 7, but it's not a focal point. Chapter 7, paragraph 1, is focusing on the theology behind covenants, that covenants are voluntary, and that covenants make rewards obtainable that otherwise would not be obtainable by virtue of the creator-creature relationship. Moving on to paragraph 2. Second London Confession, chapter 7, paragraph 2. Or, or, or before we do that, let me, let me make another comment about the covenant of works. Uh, could it be that the covenant of works is omitted from the confession because they didn't jointly concur? Uh, couldn't that explain it? But that's, that doesn't make sense. It seems like a reason, reasonable at first, but it's not. For one thing, there are at least 25 examples of 17th century particular Baptists affirming a covenant with Adam, and none of which I am aware denying it. So in the case of Thomas Hardcastle, we, we have a clear instance of someone we know having a different view from the, re, from the majority on a particular point of covenant theology. Whereas when it comes to the covenant of works, we have numerous instances affirming a covenant with Adam and none of which I am aware denying it. So we have no one, we have no historical source that would cause us to say there was disagreement about this. And then, of course, we know that the term is used in chapter 20 uh, and the theology is, is set down in chapter 6, chapter 7, and chapter 20. So if, if some were satisfied by its deletion here they would not be satisfied with its reappearance later. They would say, hey, we were supposed to take this out so we could jointly agree. Why'd you put it back in in these other places? So it doesn't make sense to think of the covenant of works as omitted for reasons of joint concurrence. It's it's not omitted. Uh, and there's no evidence of uh, discord about that doctrine in the 17th century among the particular Baptists. Getting back to chapter 7 and paragraph 2. Let's read it and make a few comments. Um, Chapter 7, paragraph 2 says, Moreover, man having brought himself under the curse of the law by his fall, it pleased the Lord to make a covenant of grace, wherein he freely offereth unto sinners life and salvation by Jesus Christ, requiring of them faith in him that they may be saved, and promising to give unto all those that are ordained unto eternal life his Holy Spirit, to make them willing and able to believe. Now, again, notice that it says that it pleased the Lord to make a covenant of grace, which is following on the language of covenants being voluntary. God did this because it pleased him to do so. It was his will to do so. It was not a necessity. Covenants are not necessary. Covenants are voluntary. Notice also that the covenant is freely offered. The covenant of grace is a free offer of life and salvation in Jesus Christ. And yet at the same time, we find that the covenant is, we, we might use the word conditional. Uh, 
because it it's explicitly states that faith is required. Faith is required in the covenant of grace so that they may be, they may be saved. No faith, no salvation. And yet faith is also promised and supplied in the covenant. And so I, I agree with John Owen, who said in his commentary on Hebrews, that let us grant that faith, I'm paraphrasing him, let us grant that faith is required in order to receive salvation. And yet that faith is promised and supplied in the covenant to receive salvation. And I'm not going to, he said, I'm not going to trouble myself with what men call it, conditional or unconditional. I would personally encourage people not to speak of it as unconditional. Um, and I probably encourage you not to speak of it as conditional either because of the, the idea of conditional or unconditional covenants uh, just doesn't necessarily work. People think that they need to sort covenants into those categories, and that's, that's not how covenants work. And so I, I would encourage not using that terminology. However, I do want to note that faith is required, but also promised and supplied uh, as confessed in chapter 7, paragraph 2. Moving on to chapter 7, paragraph 3. This covenant, the covenant of grace, is revealed in the gospel. First of all, to Adam in the promise of salvation by the seed of the woman, and afterwards by farther steps until the full discovery thereof was completed in the New Testament. And it is founded in that eternal covenant transaction that was between the Father and the Son about the redemption of the elect, and it is alone by the grace of this covenant that all of the posterity of fallen Adam that ever were saved did obtain life and a blessed immortality, man being now utterly incapable of acceptance with God upon those terms on which Adam stood in his state of innocency. Now we should notice about this paragraph that it's one of the most unique paragraphs in the entire confession relative to preceding confessional documents. The vast majority of uh, this, the Second London Confession is just copied and pasted from other preceding documents, as they, as they themselves say in their introduction, that we use the same words to express agreement in the same things. As the Savoy Divines had copied the Westminster Confession and edited it, so the particular Baptists were copying and editing those previous documents. That being said, chapter 7, paragraph 3, is one of the most unique paragraphs in the entire confession. It's not found in the preceding documents. It, it really is, uh, it seems to be written for this document, for this purpose, without a preceding text to it. However, having said that, what chapter 7, paragraph 3 actually says is not at all unique. Uh, the idea that where the gospel is, the covenant is, uh, that is not unique. That's common language in the literature of the day. That's not a, a Baptist or particular Baptist kind of thing to say. Uh, and even the language itself of paragraph 3 is very similar uh, to something William Perkins said. William Perkins said, This covenant was first of all revealed and delivered to our first parents in the Garden of Eden. Immediately after their fall by God himself in these words, the seed of the woman shall bruise the serpent's head. And afterwards it was continued and renewed with a part of Adam's posterity, as with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, etc. But it was most fully revealed and accomplished at the coming of Christ. So that kind of language of acknowledging the progressive revelation of, of the covenant of grace is very standard in Reformed Covenant theology. It's not very Baptist. If you look at John Ball, he talks about the covenant being promised and then the covenant being promulgated when Jesus Christ comes. And so you will find throughout Reformed Covenant theology uh, a, a clear acknowledgement of a progressive revelation of the covenant of grace leading up to Christ's arrival and, and full institution of it. And so we have to be careful not to overemphasize the uniqueness of chapter 7, paragraph 3. It's unique relative to preceding confessional documents, but it is not unique re relative to the theology of the day and Reformed Covenant theology uh, of that time period. Notice in this paragraph that the covenant of grace is founded on the covenant of redemption. The covenant of redemption will come up again in the next chapter when talking about Christ the mediator. Uh, there, there actually were some particular Baptists who disagreed with the idea that the covenant of redemption was distinct from the covenant of grace. Benjamin Keach 
at one time did think they were distinct and then later he changed his mind and he said he changed his mind uh, thinking that the covenant of grace and the, and the covenant of redemption were just one covenant. But here we see a, a clear confession of the covenant of redemption being the foundation for the covenant of grace. And we see lastly that chapter 7, paragraph 3 confesses that all salvation in all ages comes from the grace of this covenant. That's that's how this chapter is agreeing with the the basic and standard Reformed covenant theology that the covenant of grace is one in substance, but it is different in administration, meaning that its grace was administered to the people of God differently uh, in different time periods. And by differently, we're talking about progressive revelation and through types and shadows and such things. Yes, that we would agree that that grace is differently administered, and yet it is the same grace in all of history. Now, in later lectures, we'll talk about the usefulness and the coherence of that language of substance and administration. Why is it not used in chapter 7, paragraph 3? Well, there's, there's reasons for that that we're not going to get into here. But notice, notice that it's, it's, the, it's the foundational theology that is being confessed, even if certain words and phrases are being omitted here for good reason, I think. What is being confessed is that all salvation in all ages comes from the grace of of this covenant. And so from from my perspective as I read chapter 7 in the context of covenant uh, covenantal treatises in the 16th and 17th century and even covenantal debates in the 17th century from my perspective or in my opinion any any pedo baptist any congregationalist or presbyterian should be able to read this chapter and affirm it. Um, no doubt they would want to affirm more uh, but they could certainly affirm what is affirmed here because this expresses common agreement. But in saying that, I'm really getting to my uh, conclusions. So in, in conclusion, just to, to review, we've looked at a historical introduction to the Confession in 1677. We surveyed the purposes of its publication to express agreement, to distance themselves from heterodox particular Baptists, namely Thomas Collier, um, and to, ex to express joint uh, agreement amongst themselves, the Baptists. We looked at seven points articulating basics of Reformed Covenant theology in contrast to Papist and Anabaptist uh, errors. And then we surveyed chapter seven and its three paragraphs. So in conclusion, just four, four brief things. Number one, we find in conclusion that chapter seven of Second London Confession is Protestant and reformed. It's Protestant because it's affirming a, a, a law gospel contrast as contrary doctrines. It's reformed. It's, it's affirming the, the same grace of the covenant of grace being administered and given to all the saints, all the elect in all ages. Uh, it's Protestant and reformed. Again, any Congregationalist or Presbyterian or Continental reformed should be able to look at this and confess it without hesitation, not denying that they may want to say more, uh, or as we would want to say more, but it is Protestant and it is basic Protestant and Reformed covenant theology. It is therefore also in the second place, Irenic. Chapter 7 is Irenic toward Pado baptists It's not launching a war. It's not starting a debate. It's not a polemic against infant baptism or Pado baptist covenant theology. It's It's in many ways, an olive branch, uh, not that Presbyterians are joining in the confession with the Baptists, but it's something that they can hold in common uh, in chapter 7. And chapter 7 in the third place is charitable toward Baptists. Again, Thomas Hardcastle and others who had views like him uh, who would affirm that the Old and New Covenants are the same covenant or are one in substance, they should be able to confess chapter 7. Paragraphs 1 through 3, it's charitable. It omits that which disunites the Baptists, so that, and it includes that which unites the Baptists. So there is a charitability about chapter 7, which is an, an idea or a, a, a truth which we will re return to in a later session of the conference. And so therefore, fourthly, in the last place, the final conclusion is that if you want to understand the, the finer points of covenant theology— and the of that if you want to understand the particular baptist views relating to the finer points of covenant theology and if you want to understand the issues and arguments that distinguish them from others in the area of covenant theology you have to look outside the confession 
Uh, Even the appendix on baptism at the end of the confession gives a very brief and summarized argument for credo baptism and a very brief and summarized criticism of paedo-baptism. Even there, they don't launch into an extensive debate or, or polemic. It's, it's quite minimal, in fact. So if you, want, if you want to grasp particular Baptist covenant theology, you need to look beyond the confession. You need to look outside the confession to the literature produced by the particular Baptists of that day, the particular Baptists relating to the confession of faith. And that was my doctoral work, which has been published under the title From Shadow to Substance, The Federal Theology of the English Particular Baptist. So if you want to read secondary literature about the particular Baptist covenant theology, you can read uh, my doctoral dissertation that's been published. Although I would also encourage uh, Reformed Baptists, particular Baptists, 1689ers, to go and read the originals themselves. Um, Nehemiah Cox has been republished. Other works have been republished in one format or another, but many of them are available to read online as PDFs. It takes some getting used to, but it is well worth the investment of study in order to understand the issues and arguments that distinguished particular Baptists from others in the area of covenant theology. But you you won't find those distinctives. You won't find that especially Baptist view or particular Baptist view in chapter 7, paragraph, or chapter 7 in general, but especially in paragraph 3, you have to look outside the confession for such things. So I hope that this has been a a helpful introduction to the lectures that follow for this conference, uh, and a helpful historical and theological introduction to chapter 7 of the Confession of Faith. Thank you for your attention.